You're listening to Art Affairs, episode 64. Today I'll be talking to Tegan White. So my name is Michael Faith, and this is Art Affairs. Art Affairs is my attempt at shining a spotlight on the many wonderful people that make up this amazing art community, featuring conversations with artists, gallerists, curators, telling their stories. You can dig through previous episodes, complete with show notes, at artaffairspodcast.com, but the best way to stay plugged in is to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. And if you're really enjoying the show and want to help support what I'm doing here in an even bigger way, check out the Art Affairs Patreon. Not only does it give you an opportunity to help keep the show going, but there are several community-oriented benefits as well, like getting early access to episodes and suggesting questions for upcoming guests. You can find all the information about that at patreon.com slash artaffairs. You can also connect with the show on Instagram and Facebook at Art Affairs Podcast. All right, so today's guest is artist Tegan White. I am such a huge fan of Tegan's work, and I'm fortunate to have several of their pieces hanging in my home. I I think they're brilliant in the depth of the message that they're wanting to put out into the world. And we talk about these poignant, but also important themes that their work communicates, as well as the entire other side of their career, creating illustrated books for children, the start of an all new phase of their career, and a whole lot more. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with Tegan White. Tegan, welcome to the show. I'm so happy to have you on. This is really cool. I'm glad we could do this. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really excited. All right. Awesome. So let's dive into your background a little bit. Um, you know, it's usually where I like to start. And I know that you were you were born and grew up in the Chicago area um, and, and you know, that's a very large city with a lot of, you know, sub suburbs around it. Were you in the city proper or was it somewhere on the outskirts? Uh, I was technically in the city proper. Um, I lived on the far south side um, in a sort of in between the neighborhoods of like Beverly, Morgan Park, uh, Mount Greenwood, if anyone is familiar with the area. Um, so it was definitely like residential and like felt somewhat suburban. Um, but, you know, my address was Chicago. It's sort of the area. Um, it's super Irish Catholic. And it's the area where uh, Chicago police officers choose to live. So that oh. because they like technically have to be, um, uh, you know, live in the city to work in the city. Um, and they don't want to uh, feel like they're living in the city, I suppose. So yeah, that's where I'm from. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. They don't want to live in the area where they're supposed to be protecting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so like, what kind of work did your parents do? Anything like related to the arts? It's weird. My parents were both artists in their own ways. Um, My mom uh, did pastel and charcoal drawings. um, And my dad was a musician. But that wasn't their job, um, either of them. My dad worked at like in a factory as middle management, sort of a desk job his whole life. And uh, my mom at first was a stay-at-home mom, and then she sort of worked odd jobs um, throughout her life, a uh, nail salon, librarian, uh, bookstore, stuff like that. But she did start uh, doing art a little bit more seriously um, after all of her kids uh, had started school. And for a while, she had a studio in downtown Chicago um, and uh, you know, did art fairs that she took us to throughout our childhood and stuff like that. Um, so the arts were definitely present in my life. Um, but uh, I, I saw it less as um, a thing that you do for a living from my parents' example and more of uh, a thing that maybe you uh, do because you have to or uh, because you love it. So I think that made an impact. Okay. Sounds like it was somewhere in between hobby and profession where it was more serious than a hobby. Like she actually went to, to fairs and stuff, but uh, it wasn't quite as uh, to the level where it was a profession. Yeah, and it's partly, you know, they uh, lived in the neighborhood that um, they grew up in, um, and there wasn't a lot of art going on there. So I feel like uh, their artistic parts were like, I don't know, their 
something that they needed to do, like bursting through in spite of the circumstances or whatever. Like if they had uh, had more of an art community, they might have um, gone further with it. And they were really involved in our church and things like that uh, with the arts. Um, my mom uh, made all these uh, very beautiful, elaborate um, like banners that they would hang uh, behind the altar. Um, and my dad uh, organized a youth mass band and got like all the kids in the community into uh, doing music together. And so um, art also seemed like something very community focused to me, um, something that helped people um, and that made life feel nice. Um, but then I also encountered, uh, by watching, uh, them do those things that some people just kind of hate artists and, Mm. uh, want to like push art away out of their community. Um, because I don't know, it was, uh, when they were doing that was sort of like, uh, the Bush post 9-11 years, uh, where everything was sort of getting very conservative. Um, and our community was definitely like that. And it seemed like, uh, I don't know. Yeah. A lot of people had an issue with them trying to bring in this art that to me just felt like, uh, it was good for everyone. Um, but some people didn't see it that way. And that's hard when, when there's that kind of pushback on something that you feel so good about and, and feels bring value to people's life. Um, and so I guess, is that what got you interested in making art yourself? Just that example that your parents set? Um, I'm not really sure. Like, uh, I was just a kid who always liked to draw. Um, I, I didn't really enjoy, um, doing, uh, like very physical things. <laughs> I just wanted to sit with a box of crayons. Um, and I don't think I necessarily thought that I was going to do it for a living or anything like that. Like I thought that that was like maybe like an ideal like dream job, like a lot of kids do. But uh, I was more interested in maybe like being a writer. I also liked to read a lot when I was a kid. So uh, I knew that I was being pulled in sort of a creative, uh, poetic sort of direction. But so when somebody asked you the question of what would you like to be when you grew up, was it a writer or it was always writer? Yeah, okay. yeah. Very cool. And so were your, I guess, parents supportive in your interest in, in both writing and art, the creative side? Definitely. Um, I mean, just being creative people themselves, uh, I think they just inherently saw the value in that. You know, when I ended up uh, starting college for graphic design, that felt like, uh, you know, they weren't worried about me at all. Um, but uh, when I decided that I uh, maybe want to do illustration again or illustration instead. Um, they, uh, they're like maybe like a little bit less certain um, <laughs> <laughs> because that just, it, it's, it's a less like a job like thing in most mm-hmm. people's minds, I think. Um, uh, yeah. They, I never had any issue with my parents not supporting me. That's awesome. And I know that, that even as early as high school, you were already starting to explore graphic design. And I even saw, and this might be a little embarrassing, but <laughs> saw a redesign that you did for a CD album art of the band Bright Eyes, which was <laughs> super comprehensive, like impressive just how much that actually looked like a professional album art. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, clearly oh at that gosh, point, you had already... Oh my how did you dig that up? <laughs> <laughs> um, clearly, you had already kind of discovered that you know, visual art was something that you were starting to take seriously. Um, is it, is it high school around that time that you made that recognition? Yeah. I mean, like earlier than that, I spent a lot of time like making art and sharing it on the internet. Just, you know, I was, uh, a teen in the age when like MySpace started to be a thing (laughs) and like, uh, you know, like these art communities like DeviantArt and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, so like at first I was drawing a lot of, uh, you know, Japanese anime type stuff. Uh, I saw some of that too. <laughs> very embarrassing. Um, <laughs> but, um, I had an instructor in high school, um, who taught graphic design classes. Um, and I signed up for a graphic design class on a whim. I guess my friend was doing it. Um, and I decided I would try it out too. I didn't even know what graphic design was. Um, but like very quickly I was like, oh, like I really like this. This feels like art with a purpose or something like that. Um, and, uh, and that instructor was very encouraging and, you know, she would say things like, uh, you know, you could be doing professional work now if you wanted. And that, I don't know, just hearing that as a high school kid just made me feel really good. Um, so I kind of dropped all the anime stuff and I was like, I'm taking this seriously now. Um, I'm going to, you know, make up these, uh, projects for myself, um, and, uh, you know, think about, uh, if I could draw anything, what would I want to draw on at that time? You know, 
just music was a really important thing in my life. So I chose albums that I liked and uh, <laughs> pretended like they had hired me to redesign their album covers. That's awesome. It's amazing just how professional you were even at that age. You know? um, so you ended up going to MCAD in, in Minneapolis rather than sticking around the Chicago area. I guess what attracted you to that school specifically? Um, I just had heard from people that they had a really good uh, graphic design program. And uh, I applied to a few different schools, um, and they were able to help me out the most financially. Um, and that was really important. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. And so you started with graphic design, like you you know got excited about in high school, but then very quickly shifted to illustration, like you said a minute ago. What what I guess motivated that change of direction, and what attracted you to illustration instead of what you thought you wanted to do, graphic design? Yeah, it, it was a really quick switch because I. I think in my first semester or something, took uh, a basic like foundation drawing class, and then also at the same time, um, one of the like intro to graphic design classes. And in the graphic design class, you know, we were just laying out fonts on a page, <laughs> and in the uh, painting or in the drawing class, uh, I was really enjoying um, like working with charcoal and getting my hands in the material, um, and layering things up. And like, that just felt so much realer to me. Um, and I was like, okay, like whatever I th think of as graphic design is probably actually closer to, uh, what the school thinks of as illustration because I wanted to be drawing things, you know, like mm -hmm. that was always a part of my life. And so I think I settled on illustration as a middle ground between graphic design and fine art. Um, in hindsight, I think I really belonged in the fine art program, um, and I just didn't uh, see that as like a viable option for myself at that point in my life um, uh, in terms of like starting a career. Um, and, you know, I was always trying to be very responsible with my, uh, my life choices. So, um, yeah, I, I wish that I had uh, majored in uh, like studio art rather than illustration, but that's okay. And so what was like your, your career goal at that point? What did you want to do with that illustration degree from a, a profession perspective? Um, I don't know if I thought about any really specific application for my work at that point in time. Um, I just wanted to be able to spend my time drawing because it was all I really wanted to do. Um, and I wanted to be able to, to survive with that being the biggest part of my life. Um, and I feel like that's still sort of where I'm at with my career goals is, uh, it's, it's, um, less of a being super passionate about like, uh, the career or like any like industry or subset of il the illustration or art world. Um, and more about, uh, a refusal to do anything else. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you ended up graduating with your, your BFA in 2012. Um, so how did you feel? I guess looking back, how did you feel about that, that time in your life and the time in school and the value that it brought to your career? Was it a rewarding experience? Do you feel it helped you grow in the ways that you needed? Um, I have a lot of mixed feelings about art school. My time felt very positive while I was there. Um, I think uh, one really fantastic thing about uh, going to school for art is the access to resources that you get. And uh, also just being around other artists, I think, is a really, really important thing that artists are maybe getting less and less these days. And so, like, I I really enjoyed taking classes that were outside of my major, actually. Um, I took a lot of uh, things like paper making and book binding and a lot of painting and fine art classes. And uh, those really expanded the way that I thought about art, you know, because you, you enter art school, like as like a kid who just like maybe has a sketchbook and some pens. Um, and you're trying to go from that into, uh, like, I don't know, it, it, it should be like expanding your thinking, right. Being in this uh, art community. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's, uh, those are like electives and like, uh, other things that I dabbled in, um, are still with me you know, years and years after I've left school. Is it something that you would recommend to somebody today? Because I mean, I feel like with costs and things, it's changed a little bit as far as how that balance works. Yeah, I mean, it was astronomically expensive when I went <laughs> as well. Um, so yeah, in, in purely a financial sense, I don't know if I would really recommend it to anyone. Um, there's so many ways to get community with artists and to um, like learn things. 
And uh, I, in my experience, the things that art school will not do for you is teach you to draw. It, it won't give you a, an art style. Like, that's up to you to, to find. And uh, I don't, it, it's just not a guarantee of anything. Um, it doesn't give you a work ethic that you didn't already have, things like that. Um, so uh, how much you flourish within uh, the art school um, kind of depends on how much you yourself bring into it. Um, and I think that uh, that same dynamic operates uh, outside of the you know academic realm. Um, so you can do the same thing uh, with like a different set of resources that you're finding in your local community or whatever. It doesn't necessarily have to happen through school. Okay, and that's a great that's a great perspective. And and so after graduation, you ended up staying in in Minnesota, you know, rather than you know going back home to Chicago. Um, is it just because that had become home to you at that point? Was that where you felt most comfortable? Absolutely. Um, you know, growing up in a big city like Chicago, my idea of what nature was was like, um, you know, the trees at a playground or uh, a cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, my my parents took us to some places. Um, but like when I was like kind of older and, and didn't really get it. Um, but I always felt this innate connection to plants and animals and uh, like the earth was speaking to me um, even when I was really, really little. And so going to Minneapolis, even though it was a city, um, there's just so much nature within the city there. Um, there are all these lakes and uh, rivers running through um, and like all these uh, wetlands that like no one can really develop. There, there's nothing they can do with them, so they leave them. Um, and the city is great about uh, sort of like protecting um, the land uh, around the uh, waterways. Um, no one's allowed to like own that land. It's all public. And so like even like that little increase in access to nature totally, uh, it, it was like what I always needed. Um and I also uh, began sort of exploring outside of the city at that time in my life, um, going up to Lake Superior and also the Boundary Waters uh, Canoe Area Wilderness, um, way up uh, at the Canadian border. Um, and that blew my fucking mind. Like I had no idea uh, what it felt like to, you know, not hear cars um, <laughs> around me um, and see like uh, I don't know nature in its original form. Um, so yeah, it was super transformative just moving somewhere with just slightly more access to nature. No, it's interesting that growing up in Chicago where, I mean, in nature is, like you said, it's, it's even hard to find, um, that you kind of felt that inside of you without even knowing what it was and then kind of discovering it later and saying, oh, that's what it was. You know, that's what I've been missing. It sounds like that's sort of the experience that you had. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, I, I have uh, um, some, like, I, I guess, spiritual beliefs around nature. Um, I, I guess I identify as uh, maybe an animist or a pantheist, but uh, that is something that, um, as an adult, I had to reconnect with, um, but I know that I felt as a child. Um, I remember looking around at um, just trees in my neighborhood and thinking, like, whatever religion is telling me is God doesn't make any sense to me but these trees are God and humans are God and everything is God. And we are all sort of together and, uh, uh all wrapped up in each other. And, um, yeah, that was, uh, I don't feel like that was something that I needed to be taught. And so, you know, connecting with that in that way in, in Minnesota, I guess after school let out, you just kind of wanted to s stay with that, that location because it gave that to you. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I mean, there, there were, uh, more practical considerations as well. Um, one thing that, uh, art school did, uh, sort of provide me with was, um, a really strong community, uh, that sort of formed outside of the school. Um, I had, uh, a, um, illustration instructor who, uh, started a gallery, um, and during my senior year. Um, and it was right across the street from the school. It was a uh, really cool called uh, light gray art lab. I'm sure you know it. Um, uh, started by Lindsay Knoll and, um, yeah, she was fantastic about, uh, doing all of these things that, um, feel really important to me. Um, like creating a community, um, a local community of artists, um, giving everyone a chance. Um, like she shows a lot of, uh, sort of 
um, just like emerging artists, um, people who other galleries wouldn't give a chance to. Um, and the community that formed around that in like the following years was just like really, really fantastic and uh, fulfilling. And so uh, that is definitely one of the things that kept me in the city for a long time as well. Um, like I met so many people through that. Um, and, uh, and she started doing all of these travel programs that I participated in a little bit, um, you know, doing residencies in Iceland and other countries. Nice. I didn't realize that that had, that relationship had formed in college. I didn't realize there was that connection there. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so from a work perspective, I, I know that even before, um, you graduated while you were still in college, you'd already started started doing some freelance illustration work with, with clients. Uh, and so I guess, how did, how did that all get started and how, um, I mean, it's kind of, it's really impressive that you'd already had that sort of business acumen and know how to take these types of jobs on even before you graduated, but how did you get started with commercial illustration? Uh, it's weird. I, I feel like I was sort of just in the right place at the right time. You know, um, I had always been posting on the internet and, uh, like, in the early days of the internet, um, like not a lot of people were doing that. Not a lot of people maybe knew how to like document their work nicely and things like that. And so like, I just, I taught myself a lot of that stuff, you know, how to code a website, all of that. Um, and art directors were just starting to use the internet as a tool for the first time to find people. Um, so I feel like I kind of just lucked out, um, with a lot of my first opportunities, you know, some, uh, art directors at publishers and magazines just took a chance on me, even though, you know, they had no reason to think that I could meet a deadline or, uh, <laughs> you know, deliver a, a file that they could work with or anything like that. Um, but yeah, so I, I just started like figuring it out. And I don't think I believed that I could do illustration as a career until I found myself actually doing it. And a big reason that I really plowed ahead with it um, was just, you know, it was very expensive to be in school. Um, and I needed all of the income that I got from freelance jobs to, um, continue paying my tuition. Um, so I, yeah, I was just hustling for a lot of years, um, sleeping an hour a night for years and years and years. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. I was going to ask you how, like how you balance those two things. Cause uh, that's a lot of time, you know, I mean, you're working on your degree and trying to, to work all these jobs. Yeah, I tried to be um, very honest and transparent with my clients around that time. Um, when they would contact me about a project, I would say, uh, I would love to do this. Um, I'm in school. My schoolwork is my priority, um, just so you know. But uh, I don't know. You have a lot of energy at that age. <laughs> I, I wish I still had. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and, and I, I think I, I, I used to be very, very ambitious and uh, very about um, sort of this like hustle culture which I'm just totally not anymore. Um, but uh, I don't know. Um, I learned so much so quickly during that period. So like, I'm glad that I went through all of that, even though it was very difficult. Um, and uh, I didn't have really much of a social life during that time or whatever. Um, but I also uh, think a lot about um, how different my choices would have been if uh, money wasn't hadn't been such a thing during that part of my life um like what work would i have made um with the resources that being an art school provided to me um if i had space to slow down and think about what i actually cared about um and why i was actually making work because i i think it took years and years um of like being out of school before i really started to ask myself those questions and figure that out and do you think that that money was the key motivator for the delay in that realization or was it just you just naturally had to come to that? Because, you know, in the early days, you, you weren't even sure that art was even a viable career. And then you discovered, hey, it actually is. So it was almost like this evolution of realization of what presence art can even have in your life, you know? Yeah, um, I mean, I feel like our understanding of what is possible in our own lives um, or like what art can even be is so like oppressed and limited by uh, just what we're taught to value by society. Like art that it doesn't have a function seemed like, like this thing that society was totally dismissive of, right? Like I even, I internalized this attitude of, uh, 
you know, it's stupid to be a starving artist when you could, you know, just find some clients and, you know, support yourself or whatever. Like it's not that hard. Um, and, and it's, it, it's not that hard. Um, and so, and so I did it and I figured out how to do it. And, uh, but then since then I've been pushing myself, um, to like really question, uh, like what would the potential of art be if it wasn't linked to all of these money-making things, even like galleries, um, you know, publishing, like anything, um, like, what if art could just exist for its own sake? Like what, how, what type of work would artists make? Um, and what relationship would society have with the work that comes out of that? Um, I just, I think that it could be so much more powerful and I really feel like it's been neutered by, um, being tied up in like this capitalism and, uh, sort of like commodity fetishism. And, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, trying to figure out how to get myself further and further away from thinking about what I do as business um, and thinking about it as like an essential part of uh, like human expression and connecting with others. No, I love that. I think that's a, I really like the way that you just said that. So I will let that be. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess while you were doing all of these commercial projects, um, you know, were you able to make time for developing your own personal style, the things that weren't directly related to these uh, advertising, um, you know, freelance projects that you were working on, you know, cause I know you started showing your work in galleries not long after college. So you must've already started kind of focusing on some of that. How were you, I guess, was that something that you were kind of doing on the side at the same time just to gain some kind of personal fulfillment? Um, I think, uh, when I was more illustration focused, I was trying to figure out how to bring like the concepts that I really cared about into the illustration work, um, which at first it like there was like this illusion in my mind that that was like possible to do without um, sort of like limiting the scope of uh, my concepts. Um, and the more I did it, the more I found like uh, I can think an idea is great, but no one wants to use it because it's just, uh, it's too weird. It's too out there. It's too dark. Um, you know, the work you want to make is not colorful enough, uh, to be like eye catching, you know, like that, that's the sort of feedback, um, that I got when I tried to, uh, be myself through illustration. Um, and you know, I still do illustration work, um, for like survival. Um, and I still get that type of feedback <laughs> and it's still frustrating. Um, but yeah, expanding into more personal work and gallery work uh, was kind of essential um, for me uh, to really feel feel fulfilled by this career. Yeah, I, I just I have too much that I feel like I need to say, and I feel like it's important, and <laughs> yeah. I, I, I can't just uh, flounder around uh, trying to help other people communicate their ideas that seem to be mostly about making money. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That, that disconnect, I could, um, I could see that being this unsatisfying for you. Um, and, and so I think in 2013, just a year after you graduated, you started showing your work in a gallery setting, um, at least according to your CV, uh, starting at Nucleus, uh, in LA, uh, and you've, you know, since so showed several times in their Portland location. So how did you, I guess, first connect with Ben and, and the folks at, at Nucleus? You know, I'm not actually sure. Uh, I actually uh, showed there once during college um, at an earlier show that isn't even listed on my CV. Um, and uh, there was a different curator for that show, and I'm, I don't remember their name. It was so long ago at this point. Um, so they were sort of on my radar, and um, you know, I'm sure I've talked to Ben before about uh, how he first felt like he discovered my work, but I can't remember uh, what he would have said. Um but yeah, they, I definitely feel like uh, Ben is the first person who gave me a chance to show uh, paintings. Um, and until I started showing at Nucleus, um, most of my work was very supported by uh, like digital components. I, I've always liked working by hand, but I was doing uh, like ink drawings or pencil drawings and colorizing them in Photoshop. And it wasn't until uh, I sort of had to make a finished looking full color original for a gallery that I started, um, expanding into watercolor and gouache. And, uh, and that was sort of the, the foundation of, uh, where my style, uh, grew. Okay. So it was the, the entrance into gallery work that, that pushed you in that direction. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay. And, and I guess, how did you, um, 
how did you gain the confidence or comfort um, moving? You know, you, you mentioned earlier you've you've had a strong desire to move as far away from you know commercial illustration or things that are purely meant to make money. Um, how have you been able to move away from that? Because you know, giving up a lucrative and stable income can be a, a daunting thing. You know, so how did you gain that confidence over time to move out of it? Um, I I still don't know if I feel like I'm confident in that. Um, it just feels it feels bad to me to participate in that stuff. Um, and I think, uh, well, a, a big part of it is. Um, I had all of these very negative feelings about doing things like, like even making products, um, you know, if it's t-shirts or like whatever, um, you know, I was doing a lot of that for several years. Um, like I'm just making more stuff for my shop. And, uh, but I, I had a, a lot of negativity around the idea of like producing these things that people don't really need. Um, and, uh, I, I I didn't find any validation in the way that I felt about it um, until I met my current partner Jesse. Um, and you know, before I even brought anything like that up, like you know, they just that's where they uh, operate from is the this uh, sort of more um, uh, mindset of art for art's sake, and um, that like, why are we filling the world with all of this stuff that isn't even important to us? Um, and uh, having someone who was saying the things that I always felt in my heart um, was all that I needed to be like, okay, I'm going to cut out as much of this bullshit from my life as I possibly can. Um, and uh, it's not a business decision. It's not a smart decision. Um, and I feel like I'm uh, sort of like floundering ever since then because uh, I, I don't really uh, trust um people to, uh, like see the value in my work outside of, uh, it being linked to some uh, thing that they can buy, um, anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm so much happier since I've been moving in that direction. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, that's as much as you can ask for. And, and so, you know, fast forwarding a little bit, you, you started showing, you know, your first solo shows, I think were in 2017. Um, and it seems like, Every year since then, you've had two to three solo shows, which seems like an enormously fast pace. Like that's got to be difficult to keep up with. Um, I mean, is is that a comfortable pace for you? Would you like to, you know, back off of that a little bit? It just seems like a lot of work. <laughs> like that must have been hard. Yeah, I, I I did back off of it. Um, in sort of maybe the second year of the pandemic, it just wasn't possible. Um, with uh. I don't know the the amount that our lives kind of fell apart as a consequence of uh, you know everything closing down, um, especially schools um, because my partner has a now seven year old daughter, um, and uh, yeah I was like totally burnt out um, going into the pandemic um, and so I definitely I haven't uh, done any solo shows this year um, and don't have any more um, booked. And I don't, I don't even know if I will ever do a gallery show again, um, is how much it burnt me out, uh, to work that much. Um, but, uh, I don't, I don't know. It's like, uh, even doing two shows a year and supplementing it with, um, freelance work, like I wasn't making really enough money to do more than scrape by. So, uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Um, I'm interested in seeing, uh, how it's different if, I um, am totally self-sufficient with my work. You know, if I don't have someone taking 50% of every sale, um, I think it might be more sustainable. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's hard to let go of the um, concept of galleries as like a community space or like potentially helping other artists. Um, but uh, I just, I don't know if I can do it anymore. Mm. No, I can totally understand that. And, and I guess... Um you know, another side of your career that, that I wanted to talk with you about. I mean, your, your personal art practices is one side of your career, but you have a whole other side of your career in the children's, uh, the illustrated children's books that you do under Tiny Moth Studios. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong that, um, you know, you released your first book, uh, in that, uh, side of your art craft in 2014. So just a couple of years after you graduated, uh, Adventures with Barefoot Critters, um, 
which it's interesting. I got that um, book for one of my nieces. I, I sent you photos. I, I think I sent you photos of us reading it together <laughs> at the time, which is the most adorable thing. But I never realized it until this past week as I was looking through, um, you know, preparing for this interview that that's actually like the first letters of that spells ABC. It's an ABC book. I never put that mm-hmm. together. Like, <laughs> I never realized that. That's amazing. That, that just dawned on me. Um, anyway, um, so... I guess, how did you first get into children's books? Because it's kind of a very different side of your your art practice. Yeah, it's it's totally something I fell into by accident. Um, I sort of, uh, I I did my first like illustration of one of those little animal guys who are like vaguely anthropomorphic um, during college, uh, just because I was kind of like messing around, slacking off on an assignment. And I was like, I don't feel like doing anything serious today. I'm just going to like scribble this little thing. But I loved it. Like it just, it felt really good. And it felt like um, maybe ex- expressing part of my personality that um, my more serious work wasn't uh, able to embody. Um, and so I kind of just kept doing that. Um, and uh, yeah, after college, um, Sam, the uh, editor at Tundra Books, who put out the Adventures with Barefoot Critters, um, she found my work um, and uh, helped me turn uh, this like vague idea I had for an uh, ABC book into you know something that was worth publishing. Um, so yeah, it's a very fun collaboration. And what has your experience been with working with an editor and creative, basically other people that are part of your your the development of your art? And I guess you're you're partly used to that with some of the commercial illustration work did you do just working with clients but was that different um in the way that you've been working with like book editors um it feels very similar to any other freelance job to me yeah i mean it's it's always uh i I think with any freelance job um how good the collaboration is and uh how much it feels like it's like benefiting the work that you're making versus uh being frustrating is just based on the individual that you're working with and uh whether or not they um sort of see eye to eye with you um and like get you so i felt very lucky with my first picture book to be working with someone who i felt was really like on my side and uh, i felt like she got me and do you work much with the authors? I mean, for the I mean, you've you've written some yourself, but some of them you uh, have illustrated uh, other people's manuscripts. I guess for those cases, do you interact much with the author? Is it is it a kind of a back and forth collaborative experience, or do you kind of just have full freedom to interpret their manuscript and however however you want? There is generally no contact with the author um, until like after the illustrations are done, um, and then you know I usually. Uh, Either I reach out to the author, or they reach out to me, and we end up, uh, you know, talking about how, like, oh, isn't it cool that we made this thing together? <laughs> um, <laughs> but it, it's weird where it's like it, it already like exists um, uh, by the time you've like spoken to them for the first time. Um, and yeah, it's it's never it never feels like an illustrator plus author coming together to make a thing. It's like an illustrator, author, and an editor coming mm-hmm. together to make a thing. Um, it's like a three pronged sort of relationship. Do you like that or do you wish it was more um, directly connected to the person that wrote it? Um, I think it would be nice to uh, have more of a back and forth. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I never know uh, what the authors really think of my work. You know, they they always seem, you know, very uh, delighted with the illustrations, but it's like everyone has different tastes, you know? So, uh, I don't know if they pictured their book looking totally different or if they didn't even imagine anything and don't care or, um, but yeah, I mean, I think that all collaborations are going to be, uh, more like exciting and artistic and, uh, fulfilling for everyone. If, uh, everybody starts out in on the same page and like shares some commonality to begin with, but that's just not, um, really how the publishing industry works at this point, unfortunately. Okay. And between, you know, working in a, on a project where there's somebody else that wrote the manuscript versus ones where you write yourself, um, which of those two do you enjoy more? Or which one would you prefer to work on if given the option? Um, I suppose I would rather write my own, but I have, uh, I, I have a lot of trouble writing for kids. I feel like they're are so many really important things that I want to say to children and I'm not sure how to do that in the format of, you know, this very short book. Um, 
I, sometimes I try to start writing stuff and I'm like, I'm just rewriting the Lorax. Um, and, uh, <laughs> Dr. Seuss already did it better. So I don't, uh, <laughs> the world has no need for this book. Um, so I, I don't know. Um, my partner and I may write a book together at some point because nice. I feel like, uh, they're, um, maybe able to, uh, speak in like a more distilled, simple way, uh, than I am. Awesome. Very cool. And and so we've, we've talked about two different, two, you know, very different sides of your, your career with, you know, your, your more adult focused, um, you know, art practice, as well as the books that you do for kids under Tiny Moth Studios. Uh, and then you also have, you know, com- commercial illustration work that you do. Uh, what's the ideal like ratio between those three different aspects of your art career? Like what, what would you prefer to do? Um, is it 30, 30, 30? Like what's the, the right breakdown for you? I feel like you know the answer to this already <laughs> based on uh, what we've talked about so far. But um, yeah, my ideal breakdown is zero commercial work of any kind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> even the children's stuff. I mean, it's hard because I, I, I love it. Like, it's not like I'm like doing, like, I don't take a project unless I'm excited about it. Unless I can, uh, unless I feel good about uh at least somewhat good about, uh, what it's doing in the world. Um, like I, I like things that are educational and nature focused and, uh, you know, maybe sometimes like uh, natural science education and things like that. Um, and I try to get to make sure that I, um, am taking projects that I can get really excited about because I can envision what a good job I could do with them. Um, and so I can totally get myself excited about doing like almost anything, but I feel like that in itself is a problem. Mm. Um, and I've learned that uh, sometimes it's, it's like so many opportunities come my way, and I'm so grateful for that. But to a degree, they interfere with me really discovering uh, what I want to do as an artist. And I have had to be really strict with myself. Um, I'm getting better at it about saying no to things and um, about, I mean, it, it goes into everything because I can't even um, like look at the art that some of my friends make anymore. Because I see someone, uh, you know, making a t-shirt and I think, oh, that's really cool. Like, I love that shirt. Maybe I should make shirts. You know, like, I'm, I'm very impressionable like that. Um, but then I'm also like, there are millions of shirts that already exist and uh, there are thrift stores filled with shirts and nobody has any reason to ever make a shirt ever again. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so, and, and, and then I am trying to think about, uh, what I am like uniquely able to offer to the world and it's not, um, all of this merch and things like that. Um, and so, uh, I'm having to, I feel like withdraw more and more from society in order to keep myself in the headspace that I need to be in to make work that I feel like is actually responding to what's going on in the world. Um, and, uh, I mean, we haven't talked about all of my doom and gloom yet, but, uh, that is we'll get into that. <laughs> totally ecological <laughs> breakdown. So, <laughs> And so, you know, ze- definitely 0% on commercial. I, I sort of anticipated that. But between your, your children's book and your, you know, more, um, you know, personal art practice, would you still keep the children's book as part of your thing in an ideal world? Or would you give that up as well? You know, sometimes sometimes I think I would give it up. And then, uh, you know, just drawing with uh, my partner's daughter. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. She asked me to uh, make her a newspaper the other day. Um, because she wanted to, uh, like flip through an imaginary newspaper and I couldn't just like scribble one, even though that's all that she wanted. I like started like designing like, <laughs> this entire, like, you know, kids newspaper layout, uh, based on her favorite things, which are dinosaurs and witches and, you know, getting into all of this, uh, sort of world building with it. Um, <laughs> and that was so much fun. And I was like, oh, I would love to like, not even like my brain doesn't go to like, I want to publish it or anything like that. My brain goes to, I want to make one of these every week and Xerox it and put it in the free little libraries around my neighborhood for people to just find, you know, like that feels so much better to me than something that's commercial. Um, but unfortunately I have to pay rent, so I probably will not do that. Um, but, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there, there's uh, definitely part of me that is very attached to the, the children's work and thinks that it's important and, uh, fun. So <laughs> Awesome. So, so let's dive into the work itself. And so I want to start with, I guess, the, your, your focus on nature, because obviously that's been an enormous part of not just your art, but your life as well, clearly. Um, and, you know, having discovered that a little bit later after you got to Minneapolis and kind of made this realization, um, you know, that 
ultimately became a big passion in your life, but how did it also, I guess, become your primary focus in art? You know, because one thing, having a life passion um, is one thing, but then having that be the main focus of your creative expression, how did that take place? Hmm. Um, it's something that I found that as soon as I was in school and told to make work about any topic, like it's just what I gravitated towards. And I don't think I even understood why at first, because my... Um, physical connection to nature and to the land um, was sort of non-existent. Um, so I, I don't I don't know what that is. Like, I don't know, like, there are just things that maybe are innate in us, um, you know, that don't come from anything to do with our upbringing. Um, but I, I very quickly, once I realized that nature was the thing that made me feel good, um, I spent more time exploring and, uh, just finding things that felt really, really exciting to me. Um, you know, like I just so vividly remember the first time that I stepped into this like field in winter, um, of all this grass that had been flattened by the snow. And there were all of these small little brittle, uh, bones from some small rodent like creature scattered everywhere by whatever had been eating it. Um, and like the feeling that that gave me, um, it was almost like addictive. It was like, this is, uh, where I feel like I'm finding meaning in the world. Like, uh, I, up until then I felt like uncomfortable in the world and like aimless without purpose. Um, I feel like there are all of these, uh, sort of like ancestral skills and feelings that we have as humans that are totally obsolete in our modern world because, um, like there's like this total breakdown of community and like uh, things that feel good to do to us, like crafts, um, like making you know, a pot with your hands. Um, those are done by machines now. We don't do them. Um, and so there's something missing. Like we, no one is craving sitting at a desk and typing on a computer. We, we find ways to be excited about those things anyway, but they're not what we're meant to be doing. And so there was something about, uh, being in nature and interpreting sort of its symbols that it felt like it was leaving for me, that I know that that is my role in the world. And so I'm going to do it whether or not there's an application for it or whether or not anyone appreciates it. I'm lucky that uh, some people seem to, (laughs) but uh, yeah. I don't know if I answered your question, but <laughs> yeah, no, that was, that was great. And, and, and so, you know, while nature is, you know, your main or overarching focus, um, within that, uh, death is a common, common theme that has kind of flowed through your work in different forms over the course of your, your career and, and through your portfolio, um, which may seem, you know, outside looking in, if somebody's not familiar with your work, it may seem like, okay, well, they love nature, but then are depicting death like that. But I think diving deeper, you know, if somebody gets to know your work more, I think that becomes a little bit more clear, especially, um, you know, looking how that that focus has evolved over the years. Early on, the focus of death was more around, you know, the part that death plays in this beautiful cycle of life and appreciating it in that way. Um, and then in more recent years, focusing uh, more on, you know, the negative impacts that humans have had and the part that we've all played in the death of the natural world and and specifically the harm to animals. So I guess um, what has motivated that kind of shifting focus um, over the years and that kind of evolution of your focus on death? Yeah, Um I think uh, there, there's something uh, really cool that I discovered in Minnesota and like in the Midwest in general, where I feel like you encounter like animal death everywhere. Um, like, so for a while, I was just finding all of these dead animals. And partly it's because I uh, ride a bike and uh, the bike lane is where uh, if something gets hit by a car, uh, it just, uh, animals just end up there on the side of the road. And so, uh, I was very influenced by uh, witnessing those deaths for a while, um, like to the point that uh, I carried around a, a little like mini shovel and uh, like latex gloves in my backpack everywhere I went because uh, almost every day I was finding a dead animal and uh, burying it because it just felt, um, I mean, I'm not this sentimental anymore, but um, it, it, it felt wrong to uh, just leave it there decaying, um, having people walk by it and say like, ew, gross, um, uh, instead of, uh, having any respect or reverence for that. Um, but, uh, 
I think my focus shifted a little bit, mainly uh, because I moved to Oregon, um, and I stopped encountering uh, these like direct, like evidence of death, um, and I started listening to the land in a very different way. Um, it wasn't until I moved here, and you know, like going to. Minneapolis from Chicago was like, wow, it's so much wilder. But then going from uh, Minneapolis to Oregon, I was like, holy shit. Like, I had no idea that um, we still had things that looked like this in this country. Um, just, you know, from old growth forests um, to like the coastline, um, which if uh, people don't know, like the Oregon coastline is like uh, so incredibly like moody and foggy. And uh, I, it's where all of these dead things just wash up all the time. You know, the sand is just bits of uh, what the ocean has um, made out of uh, the things that used to live in it. Um, and uh, I'm always finding beached birds and uh, and the, the, these things that feel natural, but then also these things that are totally unnatural. So, you know, I find beached birds and to a degree, yeah, birds just wash up on the beach. But then also um, there have been all of these mass die-offs of seabird, seabirds caused by um, the warming oceans um, and sort of like intensifying uh, you know, climate disturbances. Um, and then there's plastic and styrofoam bits scattered all over the beach. And uh, and then, you know, to get to the beach, you're driving through these uh, forests that are basically these like uh, colossal timber plantations, right? They're like not really even forests anymore. Um, they're just waiting to be logged. Um, and then after they're logged, uh, they're, or even before they're, they're, they're so susceptible to wildfires because the land is being mismanaged and you can just see all of, um, this, uh, just how much our relationship with the land is totally detached from how, from ecology and, um, like the healthy cycles that need to play out, um, for us to even like continue having a world that can support us. Um, and, uh, you know, I've, I've also lived through, um, the, these catastrophic wildfires where, uh, you know, the sun has turned yellow and the, uh, or the sky has turned yellow and the sun has turned red and like ash rains down on my house, um, for days at a time. And like, uh, yeah, you just, it's, it's not something I can ignore. Um, it's something that I feel tasked with um, making work about. And, and it's hard, you know, because um, to me, it doesn't feel like any, like it's getting worse. Like I, it's hard to, to under, you know, it's hard for me to think if it's getting worse or if I'm just becoming more aware of it. And that's where I sort of introspect a little bit. I, I don't want to be dismissive of these things because I think, oh, well, I'm just more aware of them, but they've always been this way because it genuinely feels like it's getting worse. Um, but I guess, how do you feel? What do you, how do you feel about the direction things are going? Are we trending downward, upward? What's, what's your take? <laughs> oh, I think it's an eternal downward trend. I mm. mean, uh, I mean, uh, partly it's so regional, um, like different places are going to start experiencing things at different times. And uh, here in the West, uh, we're in the early years of a mega drought. And, you know, people talk about drought, but, um, and drought is a natural thing. So uh, it's normal for this period or for this uh, region of the world to go through um, a drought for a few years. But natural cycles are being exacerbated by the overall uh, changes to the climate. And so, um, scientists are thinking that we might be entering a period of like a 2000 year drought, um, that would probably basically wipe out anyone trying to live in the area. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not, uh, imaginary. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, I guess, um, my specific perspective on it is, um, I, I don't like talking about climate change very much because I don't really think that that is, um, I think that is the effect of deeper issues, right? It's the end result of people who are totally disconnected from the world that is their home. And so I'm more interested in talking about our relationship with nature uh, just like innately. And uh, so I see those things play out more in terms of like the spread of invasive species, which isn't, you know, it's linked to climate, but it's not really like 
a, a climate issue. It's not what people talk about when they talk about climate change. You know, they start talking about fossil fuels and electric cars and all of these things um, that like, uh, even if we went with all of those suggestions, those aren't solutions to the crisis that we're facing. Um, they're just, uh, I, I don't know, solar and electric is just like a, the new thing to make money through extraction and uh, you know, destroying the earth. Um, so I'm more interested in fostering a personal relationship with the land that I live on and trying to suggest to other people that maybe they would feel better if they did some of that as well. <laughs> um, and so uh, I guess um, in, in terms of my work, uh, I feel like I'm sort of documenting warning signs and uh, this, um, you know, I'm, I'm interested in things that feel like ominous or uh, like they're telling you something about what's coming because um, it's not hard to pick up the story of what's going on in our world if you just listen to nature and listen to the land and, uh, you know, really observe and open yourself to it. Like, I think that nature is speaking to us all the time and telling us what we need to do, providing us with examples of the type of action that actually works to be part of a uh, cyclical, like, alive community of organisms. And those aren't the lessons that we seem to be learning. Um, you know, we're, we're going with uh, develop more science and, and things like that. Yeah, it's almost like uh, addressing the symptom instead of the cause. You know, you, you've yeah, said the, yeah. the cause is the disconnect that we have with our, our home, um, not the, the effect of that. Or like, it's, it's like uh, the lesson of Jurassic Park, right? Like <laughs> right. The, the, the first movie uh, is about like, Hey, we should have probably just left all of this alone, right. um, <laughs> and not like had this hubris to think that we uh, have any ability to predict how our actions uh, sort of um, spiral out of our control when it comes to nature. Um, but then instead, the trajectory of the movies is uh, we're just going to make worse and worse decisions, trying to like control and contain and militarize and you know to do all of these things. That uh, it's like you should have just left it alone. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, uh, with all of that, you know, are, it, are you able to find hope? Um, because that's, I mean, it's hard to not fall into despair sometimes, but that's not productive and constructive either. So I guess, what, how do you hold on to hope in these types of things? Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm such a downer, but um, I, I, I am very hopeful. Um, or I don't know if I'm hopeful about uh, what I actually expect uh, humans to do. Um, but I think that nature is hopeful. Um, like I when when I'm looking for signs there, like as much as I see all of these horrible things playing out, I also see the way that life is constantly reasserting itself, um, reconstituting itself after trauma. And I think that that's so beautiful and like such a, a good example for us. Um, and like, whether we learn the lessons that are there for us to learn or not, it doesn't really matter to nature. It'll go on without us. Um, and uh, so, I don't know. I find some solace in that. And then I also think that, uh, I mean, it's it's strange to know that all of this is happening and um, just keep making paintings, right? Like, it feels like, what, what are you doing? Like, is this a, like, proportional and, like, sane reaction to this uh, this thing that we're living through? Um, but I think, and maybe this is just rationalization on my part, but I think that it, it is. Um, because I think that if an entire shift in the way that we think about our existence is what is needed to actually, um, you know, deal with this constructively, then... I think art is uniquely capable of changing the way that we think about things and expanding our idea of what reality can even be. Um, and so uh, I, I sort of spent the whole pandemic uh, like reading and learning and like researching. And I've been really inspired by uh, the way that um, art movements of the past were extremely politically focused. So if you look at like Dada or Surrealism or the Beat Generation or like the Situationists, like those were people who like, yeah, they made art, 
but their focus was on uh, the political aspect. Like they believed that art was a pathway to revolution. You know, they were all communists and anarchists who were getting like thrown out of the countries that they lived in and, um, and writing manifestos and coming together and creating these communities that uh, were really trying to change the world for the better. And I feel like uh, all forms of art, not just visual art, I, I think that music is extremely powerful and poetry is extremely powerful. And uh, like the, the reason that art doesn't feel like it's changing anything right now is because of its commodification. Um, because we think of visual art as something that we hang our walls and our houses and not as something transformative like we've stripped away that power um, by not expecting it to be able to serve us in that way um so uh right now i'm really trying to uh, figure out how to create community with other artists who think about some of these things in the same way that i do um, and it's hard because i'm an introvert i'm not a community builder um i wish that someone else would uh get something like that started for me um you know invite me to a commune um yeah. even a cult i don't i don't care <laughs> <laughs> if anyone out there uh feels like uh i don't know writing manifestos together um i feel like that is the sort of thing that uh helps push us forward and you are a great writer i was going to ask you about just the writing side of of what you do you know um uh, the only thing that I've really been exposed to of your writing is just things that you post or things that you publish through zines um, or just your, your artist statement for a show. But I've always been enormously impressed by just your ability to articulate a strong idea. And and so I, I just, I'm curious if, if you've ever thought about um, making that a bigger part of what you do creatively and, and publishing more of your writing. Yeah, thank you for saying that. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I, um, it's it, it's it's frustrating. Like it it's writing is becoming more and more of a part of what I do. I feel like um, I sometimes I'm at the point where I sometimes write an artist statement before I make a piece because it's like having those ideas in my mind while I'm making it is uh, sort of where um, sort of like the drive to um, really like pinpoint the feeling or the, the emotion that I'm going for comes from. But, uh, yeah, at, at the same time, like, I just, I feel like I'm a painter <laughs> and, um, I don't like pe people don't like reading anymore is part of it. Uh, so I feel like the, the most I can catch someone's attention cause we're all used to, you know, the pace of Twitter. The, the most I can catch someone's attention is just an artist statement or the caption of a post or something like that. And, uh, so I'm, I'm trying to make, uh, the visual art as impactful as the way that I'm able to write about it because I feel like that's, uh, where my skills lie. But then the problem with art, which is not a problem, it's the great thing about art, but, um, the, the, the issue is that, uh, everyone's going to have their own interpretation of an image, um, and they will not necessarily know, uh, what my goal is in uh, making that image. And I think overall, uh, I do a good job of making things that people at least get like a sort of like a, a deep feeling about uh, what it's about, what I meant. Um, it seems like a, you know, when people say that my work is dark or something like that, um, it's like, okay, at least you're getting that this isn't just like a pretty picture of a bird that it's meant to speak about more than that. But, um, the specifics are kind of only possible through written communication. So I, right now I'm enjoying the way that those two things sort of work together um, to create a fuller picture of uh, where I'm at. All right. Very cool. Um, so let's, let's dive into your process just a little bit. And I'm curious about how you arrive at your ideas for a piece. Do you do um, some form of intentional brainstorming or is it more just organic as you're exploring nature and taking pictures? Like how does your ideation process usually work? Um, I would say for the past couple of years, it's um, sort of uh, like a slow buildup of starting to realize that there's something happening for me in terms of like repeated experiences in nature and the way that I'm processing those experiences um, so it might start with something small that I get really interested in, like, uh, I don't know, like a certain leaf 
Um, <laughs> like, I don't know why I'm interested in uh, this plant right now, but it feels really important. And uh, so I just kind of like go with it. Um, and then I have more experiences and they all, I'm able to find connections between uh, the different things that happen until I realize that a theme is emerging and uh, I carry that theme into like a body of work, like a gallery show. So uh, a few years ago, um, I did um, some pieces that were about uh, my experience um, with the wildfires that came very close to Portland. And uh, that show is called Embers. And incorporating all of, like the wildlife from a specific place that I had started visiting regularly um, around that time, which actually, uh, like I think right before the show opened, um, that place uh, got burned by fires and uh, it was closed for, uh, I think, over a year. Um, and so that just like abruptly ended my relationship with that place, which was uh, very strange. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that came out of like my specific, like visiting this place over and over and over again. Um, and then right now uh, we are, you know, in the early stages of this drought in Oregon. Um, and so I feel like all of my work lately has been linked to that. And I didn't really realize that I was making work about drought at first. Um, you know, I, I went to some different places on the coast and started thinking about um, some of the seabirds and some of the way that uh, the land has changed over time. Visiting a place that used to be like a cove, but that um, people had like filled in and changed uh, to make it uh, something for shipping. Um, and like, like looking at this, uh, what was once a habitat, um, and is still a habitat, but has changed into a totally different type of habitat by humans. Um, I don't know. I started making uh, all of this work about um, water birds, and uh, and then making the connection to like I'm thinking about all of these water dwelling creatures in a time when water is becoming scarcer and scarcer. And what is it like to be these creatures who their entire existence is based on water during a like sort of epoch on earth when that is going away. So yeah, I'm, I'm still very much on this drought thing and I think that's going to last me uh, quite a while. For sure. And and so does, um, you know, I know, I know you take, um, photos a lot on, on a lot of your explanation. I love your photography. You have an amazing eye. Um, is that part of your creative process? Do your photos, uh, serve in some way as inspiration for what you end up making in your art? Um, it wasn't at first. I have taken photos since I was like a teenager. Um, I just really enjoy it as like a artistic form. Um, but not one that I really care too much to share with people or like get serious about. I do it because I enjoy it. Um, I think uh, I, I like taking photographs in nature because it helps me slow down and look at things really closely um, and not just be like oh, trying to get to the end of the hike, you know, instead I'm uh, getting up really close to things or, you know, changing uh, my like physical, like the position of my body in the environment. Um, and that might help me notice different things. Um, but I don't really care about like whether the photos turn out well or not. Um, that's not something I stress about. Um, but over time, um, you know, I've fallen in and out of taking photographs. Um, but, uh, since being in Oregon, I've realized, uh, that I end up taking photos of the things in nature that are really exciting and interesting to me. Right. Um, and so like it's, it, it is a tool that helps me come up with ideas. And, uh, then I just happen to end up with photos of the things that are interesting to me and uh, I can use those as reference. Um, and so that's felt really, really good. And I think, uh, been an important point of growth for me over the past few years is, um, really, really reducing my reliance on any sort of like found imagery, uh, taken by other people. And, uh, almost everything I draw is from my own photographs at this point. Um, I don't necessarily always have like images of like, you know, a bird's foot up close that I need. So I, I'll use some, you know, Google image search or books or whatever. Um, but for the most part, it's, uh, it's all coming from direct experience and the, the photos, uh, are really helpful with that. Well, and I'm sure that that makes them even that much more meaningful to you if they're, you know, recalling an experience that you had. Yeah, absolutely. And so once you do have a solid idea for a piece that you that you want to work on, I guess, how do you approach developing the composition for that piece? Do you do drawing sketches, your thumbnails? How do you work through that? 
Um, my compositional process has always been really, uh, I, I just jot it down in like two seconds in my notebook. Like I draw a square that is what the painting is going to be. And then like a scribble and I'm like, yep, that's it. That's the one. <laughs> it's just like, whatever is first in my head is what I get attached to. Um, and it feels really powerful to me to like, not, uh, stress too much about, um, Oh, like maybe it could be this or that and just like go with it. And, uh, I mean, it helps that like, I, I think I, I, have a very simple uh, sort of sense of composition. I like things that are centered and somewhat symmetrical and uh, things like that. I don't like to get really, I I think um, because my work is so detailed and intricate, um, I don't want a complicated composition because then it feels too busy to me along with like the style that I'm working in. So I want it to be uh, very um, like easy to digest and get what you're looking at from a distance and for that to draw you up close to then appreciate the details. So yeah, I don't get too fussy about um, composition. But from there, I uh, sometimes I work on paper and sometimes I work uh, in Photoshop. Uh, it just helps me um, sort of like move things around, uh, you know, be like, oh, the head's too small, change that, you know, things like that. Um, yeah, and I, I my uh, like drafts for a painting are usually very, very detailed. Um, it's sort of my opportunity to figure out like the anatomy of the animal that I'm drawing, um, you know, the way that uh, these leaves look and curl and things like that. So that once I'm working on the painting, all I have to think about is like color and like the way that I'm working with the material and I'm not trying to like figure out um, anatomy anymore or anything like that. Okay. Interesting. And once you do start on um, the actual final piece, do you, do you like to work on that one piece until it's completely finished or do you like to work on multiple pieces at once to sort of change things up? Um, it's funny. I, uh, sometimes if, uh, if pieces have the same color palette, especially if they're small pieces, um, I like to work on all of them at the same time. Um, because it just like sort of saves me time, like mixing color and things like that. And it's like, if they feel like they all go together, then why not just like work on them all at the same time? Um, but for larger pieces and more like one-off pieces, uh, I just work on it till it's finished. Um, but if I'm leading up to a show, I tend to sketch everything or at least like half of them before I even start painting anything because I want to know sort of what the show is about, um, and plan out, uh, you know, some big ones and some small ones. And, uh, you know, this is going to deal with like this side of this idea and these ones, uh, address it in a different way. And, you know, I, I like uh, bouncing between them and finding these different relationships and deciding what plant goes with what animal and, uh, you know, making all of those sort of like aesthetic and conceptual uh, decisions. And so when you are working on a large body like that, do you tend to form the overarching theme well in advance? I mean, it sounds like you do from what you just described that that's the first that comes before actually starting to work on the pieces. Yeah, it, it usually does. Um, I might make one piece not really understanding what the piece is about. Um, and while I'm working on it, while I'm working on it, I, uh, sort of realize like, Oh, like now, now I get it. Like I sort of start making connections. Okay. Interesting. And so your, your process for the, the work that you do for tiny moth studios, is that similar to your other art practice or is, is it different in some way? Um, it's pretty different, uh, especially because, um, I'm usually working with an art director or an editor. Um, and they usually like to see a couple versions of everything. So like, um, for my own personal work, I'm like very confident and like, this is the composition. Like I don't need to explore. Um, but, uh, for clients, I always show them at least a couple different options. And, uh, and then there's usually some revisions to the sketches. So that's a big part of the process as well. And then, um, for picture books, I like to actually work on like, I can't work on like every page at the same time, but I'll try to work on like a third of them, maybe like I'll, I'll sort them into batches, uh, based on like similar colors and stuff like that. Um, or like, uh, similar characters appearing and yeah, I'll do like all the brown and gray first on every single page. And then I'll, uh, you know, switch to the yellows and the oranges and, uh, it, it helps with a uh, consistency, um, from page to page so that it, it doesn't like, if I, I think if I worked, um, from the first page to the last page, I would be tempted to like feel dissatisfied with something about um, 
the first pieces that I did and start like changing it to try to make it better as I go. Um, and so then the book would feel maybe inconsistent. Or I, I, I also worry about like the end ones being like rushed because uh, I started to run out of time or something like that. Um, so yeah, that just, uh, that process helps me with consistency. Okay. And, and as, as, in terms of how you yourself work on these pieces, do you have to get yourself into a different headspace when you're working on, you know, your personal work versus the tiny moth studio work, or is it easy for you to kind of shift between one and the other? Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I sort of like shifting between them just because they, uh, have such a different like emotional weight to me. Um, it's nice when I make all of this, uh, sort of tragic, heavy work to shift to like, um, you know, just these cute little characters. And, uh, I, I find that when I'm drawing like a character's face, if they're smiling, like I have to be smiling to paint like <laughs> their little smiling face. So it's like, it, it is, uh, it, it, it feels very different and it feels good to bounce between them. Like by the time I've finished a book project, I'm like, okay, I really, really miss doing gallery work. Um, and by the time I finish a gallery show, I'm like, I'm ready to never do another painting again. So I, I, it's it's helpful to bounce between. Um, and, and as far as materials you use, you pretty much, you know, mostly use uh, gouache and watercolor or a combination of those. And, and so I'm, I'm curious, like how you use those in combination. What are, are there certain things that you use gouache for versus watercolor? Are there specific purposes for the two? Yeah, um, I don't know if anyone uses gouache and watercolor in the same way that I do. Um, it's sort of like a, just I've slowly developed um, all these preferences for like when I use which one. And, it, and it's hard to actually explain, um, but it has to do with uh, the opacity of different colors, um, the way that it absorbs into the paper, how how it sits on the brush and like allows me to uh like be like detailed enough or uh like flat enough where I want to it, it yeah it's it's very complicated um so I, I definitely have um like certain colors that are always done in watercolor in my paintings and then like sometimes when I shift to like maybe like the darker colors or like uh colors of certain saturations I find that um they're difficult to work with in watercolor um, because uh, I would have to like build up lots and lots of layers to get the intensity that I want um, or like the darkness that I want. Um, or I would have to work with it drier than I want in order to get that darkness or intensity. So I switched to gouache because it behaves differently with those colors. But <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, it's very complicated. Oh, very cool. It sounds more of an art than a science, uh, uh, yeah. so to speak. And so another another form of art that you've, you've explored, um, you know, if, uh, I think starting a few years ago um, is cyanotype. Um, I guess what, mm -hmm. what motivated your explorations into that type of art making? I started making cyanotypes totally on a whim. Like one day I just decided that I wanted to make a bunch of blue work because <laughs> I never used the color blue which is, it's such a silly reason. Um, but, and like, I, I was just like aware that cyanotype existed and I was really curious about whether or not, because um, if people don't know what cyanotype is, um, it's basically, a, it's a alternative photographic process where you coat a, a piece of paper with this light sensitive emulsion and it's a form of contact printing. And so you see um, a lot of like reproductions of uh, flowers, like people will lay down plants and flowers um, and expose it to the sun. And then you get an impression, like an, an image that's based on uh, what areas the sun touched versus where it was blocked. Um, so you get like these like beautiful, like transparent like leaves where you can see all the veins and things like that. Um, so uh, yeah, it's, it's usually used for just these like... Um, you know, fun botanic uh, purposes. And I was really curious about whether or not I could use it in a way that's sort of like similar to screen printing almost, where um, I uh, am printing out like a line drawing on a transparency and laying that over the emulsion and creating prints that way. Um, and I had no idea if it would work. I had never seen anyone do that before. Um, I just wanted to try. And so I uh, found that it worked fantastic. And I, I really don't know why more people aren't doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and even like I, my expectations were low for like the clarity that it would be able to reproduce. Um, but uh, it, 
actually worked way better than I thought. And it even works for, um, you know, not line drawings. Like I can uh, reproduce an entire painting with like a full value range and, uh, and they come up beautifully. And uh, I, I really love the, have come to love the process because, um, you know, even though you're using these like photosensitive chemicals, um, it feels like such a collaboration with the sun and with water because after you expose the print, you're like washing it out with water and, um, you know, the exact amount of time that you expose it for and like the time of day it is and the season, all of that impacts the result that you're going to get in the print. And so it feels like unpredictable and it feels like working with the earth in this uh, really fun way. And one limitation of cyanotype that I think uh, stops a lot of people from being interested in it is that it creates these blue images, right? This like, it's this characteristic Prussian blue uh, color. Um, and uh, I understand not everyone wants to make a bunch of blue work. I don't really either. <laughs> but uh uh, there are all these different ways that you can actually tone the cyanotype um, because it's like uh, it's like this iron-based compound that creates the print. Um, and so uh, any plant material that contains tannins will bind to the iron compounds. I, I'm not a science person, probably explaining this terribly, um, but they'll, they permanently bind with it and change the color. So you can get really interesting results with uh, different teas will turn things more purplish or more greenish. Um, but what I've, uh, because I am a goth kid and want everything to be sort of like moody and monochrome, um, I've uh, been trying to get like the truest like black and white and brown tones that I can, um, but, like totally eliminate and like reverse the blue. And so uh, I, uh, coffee works decently, but, um, I've had the best results from, um, foraging acorns and, oak, uh, uh, black walnuts and, uh, like processing those, uh, creating a dye and, uh, soaking the print in that. Um, and I get these really, really beautiful browns that I love. Um, and then it also becomes this, uh, this process of, um, you know, working with the land and, uh, I get to go and harvest acorns from specific trees that I like and things like that. Now that's beautiful. Um, are, are there other types of um, like mediums that you've wanted to explore that you haven't had an opportunity to? Uh, yeah. So I've felt myself pulled in a more sculptural direction lately. Um, that's something that I've always wanted to explore. Um, I think uh, I've been making all of this work about woodpeckers lately and, um, and, you know, there's a bunch of uh, you know, environmental stuff that goes into that. But um, it occurs to me that if the woodpecker is my muse, then I should probably be doing some woodworking myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, I started making um, these very simple, uh, like, bird silhouettes out of pieces of wood um, with, like, a hole in their uh, like chest cavity. And, uh, those are really fun to make. Uh, and I would like to do more things like that, but also, um, my partner is a really big influence on my work, uh, because they're an artist as well. And, um, they tend to like make work that incorporates nature objects or, um, that is itself like, like feels like a nature object. And I'm very influenced by that. And we've been, uh, starting to try to figure out how to work more collaboratively um, and like fuse our styles together. Um, so I definitely want to, I, I have a bunch of ideas for um, more sculptural pieces that I want to make with them. Um, but it's, uh, you know, completely different than my uh, skill set. <laughs> awesome. Very cool. So that's a good segue into talking about what you've been up to lately and what you have coming up. Um, you know, I guess what's been your main focus this year and, and what is like the rest of 2022 look like for you? Um, <laughs> I haven't been doing anything, dude. Uh, I'm I'm coming out of a pretty intense period of burnout, and I've read it takes a couple of years to recover from that. Like the other side of burnout, it's usually two to three years. Um, I mean, I don't mean to prescribe that for you, but I, I, I that's what I've read. You know? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if that means anything to me because I feel like my burnout isn't like uh, whatever society says burnout is, and it's more like living through a pandemic and realizing that uh, the world is a different place on the other side of it, and it's probably never going to go back to the way that it was, um, and the way that it was wasn't ever that good anyway. <laughs> right, so yeah. I, I, I'm more of like existential dread, I guess. I'm just calling it burnout as a, 
shorthand. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to figure out what to do with uh, all of those feelings. Um, and I feel very uh, inspired at the moment, but uh, less inspired to sit down and make pieces. So I have like a bunch of work in my head that I want to make. But I think it's been hard and like I had long COVID for um, like six months this past year. Uh, so like my energy levels have been very affected by that. Um, I'm starting to feel better now. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm just I'm trying to get back into it. Um, but I, I feel like whatever work I'm going to be making next um, is like stage two. Like um, it's not going to be very much like work that I've done in the past because the things that I care about have really changed over the past few years. Um, and I'm just trying to get weirder with it, more experimental, um, more true to my values. I, I really feel like I'm in sort of like a tearing down phase, um, discarding the things in my past that aren't useful anymore. And I'm very excited about it. I think it's going to lead to some good places. And, and you mentioned earlier that, that you might not, or you might, presented in different ways than you have in the past in, in the sense that, you know, maybe a gallery w isn't the right option. Um, have you thought about how you want to present what this new work ended up becoming? I don't know. I feel like that's the hardest part, right? Um, I think uh, I, I really want to connect with other people who um, think about the world the same way as me. I feel like I keep saying that. Um, but uh, I think that uh, the institutions that uh, – support artists right now are not very conducive to doing that like if we think about you know gallery spaces that you know I, I have a lot of respect for um the gallerists that I've worked with I wouldn't work with them if I didn't think they were good people um but like it is a capitalist space right it exists um to make money it's a business and so it's never uh, going to be inclusive of perspectives that challenge that reality and the same with like social media is like the other place where artists find community and uh, social media isn't conducive to critiques of social media. Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel like we need more artists interacting in the physical world with each other, having deeper conversations than are possible um, through these, I don't know, digital means. And, uh, and I don't know how to create that. Um, but, <laughs> um, and, and in some ways, like it shouldn't be my job because like my job is to make the work, you know, right. to put the ideas out there. But, uh, I think, um, some things that have been really exciting recently is actually connecting with people who are sort of outside of, um, the art world and, um, more interested in, uh, like politics and, um, philosophy, uh, so um, I've been talking to like some people who run like uh, anarcho surrealist uh, zines and magazines and uh, publishing houses and stuff like that, and that feels like a really um, natural progression for me with like my thinking about the world right now um, to connect with some of those people. So uh, yeah, I'm sort of like sending out feelers in all these different directions, um, and it's a uh, yeah, it, uh, it feels like a big departure from um, a traditional art path is the way that most people think of it at this point in the world no i mean from all we talked about i think that that makes a lot of sense um you know and, and i think there's a lot of general dissatisfaction with the state of capitalism in general <laughs> i mean across the board you know yeah it's frustrating because like i feel like everyone feels it um but we just make these vague references to it instead right. of like really like unpacking it and figuring out like alternatives and like, I know that we're all exhausted and we're all just trying to survive and pay rent. And I totally feel that myself. Um, but uh, I don't know, nothing's ever going to change unless we try to build something different. Yeah, that's very true. And that's, that's sort of related to something that I've been talking a lot uh, about with one of my friends, this, this concept of hypernormalization. There was a, um, a Russian professor and he... Uh, was a professor at the University of California, but he grew up in Leningrad during the Soviet Union. And in the early 2000s, he wrote a book about the decade or two just before the collapse of the Soviet Union. And, you know, 
the 10 years leading up to the collapse, you know, the society, the people at large, the community, the working class especially, really felt that things were bad. They knew in their heart that things were just not right, but they didn't know what to do about it. So they just kept going to their job every day and, um, you know, treating life as if it was normal when it was anything but normal um, because they just didn't know what to do about it. And so I think there are a lot of parallels with what we're experiencing today and especially in America you know, and, and I think a lot of people are feeling that unsettled feeling yeah. of something just being wrong. It's broken, but nobody knows what to do about it. You know, there's there's people that are working and people that are that are doing really good activism. But by and large, we're all still just going to our jobs, going to the grocery store, just treating, watching TV. And, and I go to my office job every day, you know, because I just don't know what to do about that. It's such an enormous systemic problem you know yeah. and so I, I really think that that concept of hypernormalization really is being felt by a lot of people today you know absolutely yeah and like i don't blame any like individual person for this you know like i think that uh we're all doing what we've been taught by our society um we should do right. and uh and we've all been told that uh you know, not participating in capitalism and careerism and stuff like that uh, makes you obsolete. Um, like there, there's no place for anything outside of this system. Um, and so, yeah, of course you're just gonna kind of trudge along knowing that everything is wrong, but uh, not <laughs> feeling, feeling ill-equipped to do anything about it. I think is yeah, how I feel. Yeah. It's like, I don't know what to do about these feelings, you know? Um, so weird, um, place to ask you where people can find you online, but <laughs> that's usually how I like to close things out. So if people did want to, you know, stay up to date and learn about the, the new directions that you're going in, where would they find you? Uh, yeah, I'm on Instagram at Tegan WH. Um, and then, uh, you can go to my website, TeganWhite.com and, uh, you can be on my mailing list if you want, um, but if you want to talk about how fucked up the world is, especially in the context of nature, um, and you want to write anarchist manifestos about it, then you should totally message your email. <laughs> <laughs> Putting the, the word out now. Anybody that wants to get in touch and get involved. Um, and so I usually like to close out with a question that I've been asking everybody, which is, uh, who is one artist that you'd like to see me have on the show? Oh, um... Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if she goes by uh, a name other than this, um, but uh, Fiona Bearclaw or Fiona Barnacle is this really incredible Oregon-based uh, printmaker. She makes these beautiful line cuts of uh, like ecological themes um, on like these handmade papers, and they're absolutely incredible, uh, especially in person. She sent me some, and, and they're so intricate and beautiful. Um, but uh, she lives like in the woods somewhere with her partner just doing some strange I, I don't know what their life is like but it seems like my ideal life um <laughs> so i'm very curious about what uh their whole situation is out there and uh, i haven't been able to stop by and visit yet to check it out myself so uh, i think that she would be a really awesome person to have on um also uh i i really like um artists who uh sort of develop a like their own visual language that clearly like like having like uh, recurring like imagery and themes that you can tell means something to them, but you're not really sure what it is. And uh, two artists who do that who come to mind um, that I'm very curious about are uh, Pat Perry, um, muralist, um, and uh, Nokomi Nix Turner. I think you know her work. Um, yeah. So I, I, they're they're people that seem very like mysterious and interesting to me, and like they're on the right track of uh, some very interesting concepts. Awesome. Very cool. Um, before we go, though, there is a song that you gave me, and I wanted to give an opportunity to introduce it. I was going to put it as the outro music, so I just wondered if you'd want to say anything about it to the listeners. Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, last week, um, my partner's daughter uh, went out into our backyard alone and turned on her iPad and sang this song just as like one take and uh, just about the beauty of nature uh, <laughs> and my, my partner took it and like put a simple uh like guitar riff over it and i think that it's really like incredibly beautiful and um it's sort of like what my 
uh, life feels like is uh, part of the reason that I wanted it to be in the episode. Um, and also because I don't know if I uh, always do a good job of expressing the things that I care about and find valuable, um, especially like verbally, like in a context like this. So I figured if I did a bad job of explaining what I think, um, she did a fantastic job in this song. So you can just listen to that and, uh, uh, yeah, hear it from the mouth of a child. (laughs) Awesome. Very cool. Tegan, thank you so much for coming on the show. This is, this has been a real treat for me. Obviously I'm an enormous fan. Um, and, and I'm, you know, grateful to have you as a friend. So it's been really good catching up with you. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for this, Michael. I, I hope that, uh, no, you have a happier day than whatever <laughs> mood I'm leaving <laughs> everyone in. <laughs> so that's it for this episode of Art Affairs. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Tegan. I really love so much of what they had to say. Um, But before we get into anything specific, I wanted to read a quote from an interview that they gave several years ago that I came across as I was preparing for our conversation, which I think really captures Tegan so well. The interviewer had asked Tegan what advice that they'd have for someone aspiring to be an artist, and this is what they had to say. Let your work be an expression of who you are, not what you think someone else wants to see or a replica of someone else's style that you think is good. It takes time to develop your interior nature into an external expression that other people will appreciate. But when you get there, it will be more powerful and rewarding than an imitation, which will always ring empty. I think that describes Tegan to a T, unwaveringly focused on the things and the issues that are important to them and funneling that passion and that energy into their art. It was really interesting to learn more about how the purpose or the message of death in their work has evolved over the years. How it was originally highlighting the part that death plays in this beautiful cycle of life, uh, and a celebration of that, letting you know that death is not scary or horrific, but something to treat with reverence. But then in more recent years, their focus on animal death shifted to, you know, shine a light on the kinds of unnatural deaths that we humans have caused and the damage that we're doing to the environment, caused in large part by our disconnection from the natural world. And with this focus, death is scary, but not because it's frightening in itself, but rather because of what's causing these deaths. It's such a strong and much needed message, and I hope that people are able to take that away from this work, and that it causes people to think about it in those ways and and potentially take action. I'm eager to see how Tegan's practice transforms in the next phase of their career. They definitely seem to have a strong desire to distance themselves as much as possible from, you know, the hooks of capitalism, striving to make work that's meaningful to them and trying not to get caught up with, you know, what is sellable or marketable. Making art for art's sake, and as, you know, a necessary outlet for self-expression, and finding value in that. It'll be interesting to see what these connections with more political-oriented writers and, you know, activists manifest into. You know, like we were talking about, I I think so many of us feel these, you know, deep-seated problems within our soul but just don't know what to do about it. So I'd love to see, you know, if that turns into some kind of bigger action or some form of activism. Oh, and before I wrap up, don't forget to stay tuned for the outro music and and listen to a song that Tegan's partner and their daughter made. It's actually quite beautiful. So thanks again to Tegan for joining me today, and thank you for checking out the show. I'm truly grateful for your support. And just a reminder, one big way you could help out if you're really enjoying the show would be to check out the show's Patreon. You can find all the details on patreon.com slash artaffairs. And as always, you can contact me through my website at artaffairspodcast.com or on Instagram at artaffairspodcast. So until next time, be good to yourself and be good to each other. Thank mm-hmm. you.